Well, hello, Pioneer family on this Pioneer Sunday. You know, we've just had our annual leaders conference at the weekend at the Hayes Conference Centre in Swanwick, celebrating 40 years of Pioneer. We actually sold out of tickets. Thank goodness there was an online option. There's so much to celebrate about the last 40 years of Pioneer. There are so many lives that have been changed and impacted. There's so many communities that have been transformed and new neighbourhood narratives have been written as we've told a different story that communicates God's love for a place. There's so many initiatives that Pioneer as a network has been instrumental in birthing like ASSET, AIDS, Care, Education and Training, Fusion, 24-7 Prayer, Hope Schools and so many, many more. So we take our hats off to the past, but we also put our coats on to the future. The context we find ourselves now is obviously very different to 40 years ago. The cultural landscape is very different. The church landscape is very different. But what remains is that Jesus changes lives and we are caught up in his kingdom cause. As a national leadership team, we've been dreaming together of what the next 10 years will be about, what Pioneer will look like at 50. And I think it can be summed up with two words, health and growth. We know that growth and particularly multiplication is part of our future, but we want to make sure that what we are multiplying is health. And so that is an initial focus, healthy individuals and healthy church cultures. And health comes from abiding and rooting in Jesus. And from there we advance and we bear healthy fruit that lasts. The key ingredients for our next 10 years can be found, I believe, in John 15, which can be summed up as abide, love and bear fruit. So we know the well-known passage, don't we, about abiding in the vine. I want to read it to you from the message translation. I am the real vine and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes and every branch that is grape bearing he prunes back so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the true vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relationship is intimate and organic. The harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up, thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command. Love one another the way I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and I put you in the world to bear fruit fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. So what does it mean for us as pioneer that first we abide in him before we bear fruit? Well, verse four, live in me, make your home in me just as I do in you. Verse five, I am the, I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relationship is intimate and organic. The harvest is sure to be abundant. Verse nine, I've loved you the way that my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. Just pause, maybe just even close your eyes. 
What does it mean to make yourself at home in his love? His love is our truest home, our anchor in the storms, our default setting. And you know, the more we understand how much we are loved by Father God, the more we will want to remain in his love, make our home in his love. If we're wary or in any way unsure of his never-ending, unconditional, relentless love for us, then we'll dip in and out of abiding. We'll, we'll connect and pull away and connect and pull away again. I believe one of the reasons that we've seen many of our churches create more space for worship and spaces to linger in his presence is because that is a key vehicle for God's love pouring into our hearts. It's a God-given way that, that we get to live in his love, to make ourselves at home in his love. We found here just at Open Heaven that our monthly worship spaces, which we call Upper Room, are becoming very sacred spaces and people just keep on coming because it's a way to soak into God's love. And so God is drawing his people into deeper and deeper places of surrender. And as we do that, we're deepening those roots of abiding in his love, making ourselves at home in his love. I remember reading a story of an old man who, who used to slip into a church building at the same time every single day without fail. Come rain, come shine. And the leader watched him come in by himself and leave by himself day after day, month after month. At last, when the church leader got to talk to the old man, he said, what do you do when you just sit here? The old man smiled a slow smile and said, I look at him and he looks at me and we tell each other that we love each other. And that's a beautiful picture of abiding, making ourselves at home in his love. And then alongside spaces to linger in his presence, I know a number of our churches are going after what they're calling an emphasis on both the word and the spirit. Here at Open Heaven, we're reading the whole of the New Testament as a whole church across the whole year. You know, LICC have recently produced some research on the role of spiritual practices in making whole life disciples. And the report reads this. However we sliced and diced the results from the survey, the Bible always came out at the heart of everything good. It ranked second as the most frequently used practice, 62% most days, a further 20% once or twice a week. It also ranked top as people's most formative and enjoyable practice. Those who particularly value reading the Bible talked about how it enhances their relationship with God, how it helps them to gain perspective and focus and how it helps them to live better. They said things like, it brings me closer to God to understand more of his love and his ways for my life. And it's God's word helping me find my place in his story. It gives me perspective and guidance. On just about every area of discipleship that was measured, those who were committed to regular reading of the Bible scored more highly compared to the overall sample. It seems to lead to a healthier perspective, better decision making, and an increased ability and desire to share faith more effectively. People tend to be more thankful, better at loving the people around them, and they say they respond better to difficult people or situations they encounter. That, of course, backs up what's in the John 15 passage too, where it says, make yourself at home in my love, and if you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my father's commands, says Jesus, and made myself at home in his love. And so, of course, we can keep his commands as we read his commands and then do what it says. So as we abide in word and we abide in spirit, we often discover a sense of spiritual health or personal renewal, or as some people are describing it, an awkward personal revival. And then, of course, there's a, a, a new level of surrender, perhaps with new habits as we're going deeper into loving God and knowing what it is to be loved by him. And then what happens is there's a corresponding love that grows for each other. So personal renewal leads to relational renewal. It leads to healthy churches. And healthy church cultures are characterized by grace, encouragement, and love. Again, in that passage, this is my command, love one another the way I've loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. And then again, remember the root command, love one another. Healthy church cultures are where people love each other enough that they are real with each other. They're not interested in shallow pseudo community. 
And many churches are finding that there are braver conversations that are happening with real depth, openness, honesty, accountability, even confession. There's a desire for deep discipleship. And so as one-to-one relationships and small groups are going deeper in loving each other, it then affects the church gathered when everyone comes together. Churches begin to get renewed. <clears throat> People sing louder because their hearts are full of love for Jesus. They stay around for longer at the end because they really care for the people who are around them. There's an expectancy for God's spirit to break in that means the supernatural evidence of God is tangible and palpable whether that's prophetic words that are shared, explosions of generosity, people getting saved or healed. The Holy Spirit invades church cultures that honour Jesus and honour each other. The Holy Spirit loves to hang out in those kinds of cultures. So out of then health as individuals and health as churches, there comes fruit, and it's fruit that will last. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. Again, you didn't choose me, I chose you, and I put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. And you know, as we've listened to God together as a team, we looked at prophetic words, we know that the next 10 years of Pioneer is firstly about health, and then it's about growth and fruit. Not just growth for growth's sake, that looks good on a graph, but growth that glorifies God. As a team, we are believing that Pioneer as a network will treble in size over these next 10 years to 150 Pioneer churches, including at least 50 church plants, which of course in turn trebles the fruit of changed lives and changed communities into 150 different places and spaces. And as this growth happens, you know, churches are joining us But we're looking to see new expressions of church get planted primarily. You know, we welcome six new churches into Pioneer at the conference, and there's another six or seven on the journey of joining us that hopefully we'll get to welcome at next year's conference. We know that churches are being attracted to Pioneer at this time because they see health, they see life, they see strength, they see leadership they can instinctively trust. They see values they relate to, and they see a vision of taking the gospel into new places and spaces that excites them. So that trajectory of churches joining us is set to continue. But we've also began to see a small increase in the planting of missional expressions. One church is buying a farmhouse to plant into a praying community. One church is opening a coffee shop to create a worshipping community in that space. One church is seeing fruit on an estate where they run a food bank and a messy church. And the beautiful thing about Pioneer is that our creativity means all of our plants over the next 10 years will be deliciously different. Some will be missional communities like Phil and Julie Stokes in Camberwell that when it gets too big for their living room, they'll multiply. Some will be bilingual churches like Lighthouse Church on Anglesey. Some will be starting first with community engagement projects like food banks and community groceries and cap centres and schools. And out of that, creating disciple-making, worshipping communities, often on deprived estates. And some will be perhaps more conventional church planting teams sent out from some of our bigger resource churches to plant a vibrant congregation where there is none and perhaps even bringing redundant church buildings back to life. And as long as a new expression of church has these three aspects to it, up, in, and out, it is church. It has to have meaningful worship, disciple-making community, and mission, the up, in, out. Because if everything is church, then nothing is church. So it has to have the irreducible minimum of worship and community and mission. But in that, it gives us great freedom and flexibility our plants will be less like a packet of Maryland cookies and more like a Christmas box of assorted biscuits. So as we abide in him and we love each other, we advance the kingdom. So the future of Pioneer is one of health and growth. I'm hoping that right now on your chairs, there's a Pioneer Impact Report and an Everyday Pioneer Flyer. The impact report is worth reading. It shows some of the fruit we're seeing. At the time of filming this, which is before all the responses were back in, there were over 300 people who had become Christians or recommitted their lives back to God. Over 250 people had done Alpha. There were 88 community engagement projects serving over 16,000 people. By the time of being published, 
those numbers may well be more in the report. And so over these next 10 years, as we grow as a network, this fruit will grow. We're believing that this fruit will treble. That would mean that across the network, perhaps every year, we'd be seeing about 1,000 people becoming Christians or recommitting their lives back to God. That would mean over 260 community engagement projects that would be serving over 48,000 people. Friends, Pioneer is at a critical point into growth and impact. And our resources currently don't match our vision. Some of our regional leaders are not yet paid. Some who are do way more than their hours as they support the growing churches in their regions. If everyone watching this on Pioneer Sunday became an everyday pioneer, perhaps some could give just five pounds a month. Others who could afford it could give 25 pounds a month. And even some of you who've got kingdom resources to steward in kingdom hands perhaps could give 150 pounds a month we'd have a good financial foundation to give us what we need to crack on with the vision that God's given us. It's worth knowing that 10% of every gift goes towards the work of Pioneer International as well. So what you invest goes far and wide across the Pioneer family. So would you just take a couple of minutes now and ask God how to respond? There's a QR code on the screen or on the flyer to become an everyday pioneer. Just one thing to note, please make for sure that first you're giving regularly to your local pioneer church before you start giving to the network. And as a little thank you to anyone who sets up a standing order this weekend, you'll be sent an email offering you a half price ticket to next year's Pioneer Leaders Conference. But mostly your thank you will hopefully be the knowledge that you're investing in something good, something that God is building across Pioneer as we step into more health and growth that glorifies him. Thanks, everyone.